Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed the event last night. I think. Uh, oh, just a little bit. They were uh, talking of animal replacement. I think we could have replaced some of the animals we saw last night um, based on the, what we saw. So, um, yeah. So, this morning I'm going to talk about um, uh, not, not so much the science around replacing um, uh, animal methods, but really around how do we go about getting these into regulatory um, uh, regulatory domains and how do we, um, what are the barriers to doing that and how are these uh, adopted in, in drug discovery. So um, I'll spend a bit of time just talk, well, a couple of slides just on drug discovery itself, um, the status and, and where animals are used, and then talk about the barriers to adoption uh, of using uh, human relevant methods. Um, and also then uh, give you some examples of some initiatives and, and progress that's been made uh, with these models. So just a bit of background on drug discovery. I'm sure a lot of you know this, um, but it's quite clear that uh, productivity in drug discovery is uh, in decline. And there's a number of graphs here just showing this. So um, the top, this graph here is just showing you how... Um, even no investment in, in drug discovery over you know, 40, 50 years has increased, we're still seeing the productivity decrease. So we're not seeing any more uh, higher numbers of drugs that are approved. So uh, despite all that investment, there's no uh, improvement. And actually, uh, Deloitte here, this graph is showing that um, the return on the investment really uh, for R&D in, in drug discovery is really at an all-time low. And part of this reason is that the costs have gone up, as we've just talked about here. So the cost to develop a new drug is uh, estimated around to be around $2 billion uh, at the moment. And the returns aren't so good. So we're not seeing any of those blockbuster drugs coming through. We're seeing a lot more um, focused diseases and, and targeting focused diseases rather than the blockbusters which um, we've seen in the past. Another reason why productivity is failing, we believe, is that um, the process itself probably needs to be retooled. It's a process that's been going on, this kind of linear process has been going on for a number of years. And really it's dependent on a lot of legacy processes and models and, and you know, animals are part of that. It's not the whole reason, but the animal models are part of that. And the other piece is just that we don't involve patients in the early discovery stages either, and that's probably remiss. And I think there's a lot more efforts now to try and address um, using uh, patients and, and conditions and understanding the diseases better before we uh, develop drugs. And, you know, there's a lot of statistics banded around about the number of drugs failing. Um, but also, I think probably the biggest uh, issue is that we see a lot of adverse drug reactions and, and you know, it can be quite uh, impactful in terms of um, costs and also obviously lives associated with uh, deaths from those adverse drug reactions. But, you know, there's a good uh, steady increase in the number of in vitro tests that are being used by farm. We've seen a lot of applications described yesterday. I'm not going to go into details because I think we saw lots of those yesterday and we'll probably see more today. And, you know, um, this, that's documented, but also we're seeing since then um, a lot more uh, in vitro tests are being used by the pharma industry. And what also is uh, impactful here is that we're seeing a lot of organizations develop roadmaps to look at alternative ways of testing um, so here are just some of them so in the UK we there was a, a roadmap developed by a number of the research bodies uh, towards non-animal technologies um, we've seen a lot of sort of organ on a chip discussions and that uh, yesterday and we'll see more today I'm sure so there's um, you know things from the medicines discovery catapult and also the European <coughs> organization ORCID uh, organs on a chip in development and then we've also seen uh, things from the US so the ICFAM organization is very uh, proactive in developing new approaches um, in, in drug discovery and also encouragingly regulators like the FDA uh, with their predictive toxicology roadmap. So I just want to talk a bit about the barriers 
to adoption of these technologies, and I see them really in uh, four uh, areas. Got a bit of a typo there, sorry. Um, so there's the legacy piece, and I'll talk a bit more in detail about each of those. So the legacy in terms of using animals and using uh, traditional methods that maybe aren't fit for purpose. Uh, financial reasons, scientific reasons, be they about the actual uh, knowledge about disease and how it's caused or the actual technologies that are being used and limitations there. And probably the biggest piece is around the validation um, and how do we go about uh, validating these new technologies. So in terms of legacy, this is um, a presentation that was given at the, lo uh, the recent uh, annual congress for the uh, British Tox Society um, from the NC3Rs, um, so it's preliminary data. And they have done a survey of around 18 pharma in the UK, and they looked at um, how they choose what species is used um, to test their drugs. And what's uh, probably a bit concerning is that rather than picking up on the pharmacological relevance of the model that's being used, which you would hope would be you know, the, the first choice, a lot of it is to do with background data. So people are selecting uh, models that have been used in the past to test their new products coming through uh, based on you know, background data, which you know, that gives you an understanding of how that model will behave, but is it really the most pharmacological relevant model to you? So um, somewhat disturbing is seeing these types of um, uh, uh, graphs to show, you know, and, and these are the sorts of things we need to get over. And I think things like education, um, is a key piece in, in, in challenging these types of uh, uh, decisions. Um, financial barriers, we all know there's a multi-billion pound industry around um, pharma and, and you know, using animals as well. And you know, when you look at this report um, in terms of the value, in terms of the total industry sales, so over two billion euros uh, just in Europe, and that's about 22% of the world market. So we're talking a trillion euros associated with the pharma industry. So, you know, you can imagine there's a, a lot of costs and, and um, uh, you know, financial commitments to, to staying with animals. There's also a lot of uh, uh, effects in terms of liability protection. So we've seen where drugs have maybe failed in the market and, um, you know, uh, uh, patients bring suits against um, pharmaceutical companies, so there's a lot of money associated with that. And also there's probably a disproportionate um, uh, funding for new uh, alternative technologies. Um, having said that, you know, there's a number of initiatives ongoing where, where a number of company, uh, sorry, a number of organisations have funded those types of uh, approaches. In terms of other barriers, there's always going to be scientific and technical ones, be it you know, just fundamental knowledge gaps in terms of disease cause and pathways, but also in terms of the technologies themselves. And I think we've touched on some of these as well yesterday. So things like um, you know, exchange between different organs, tissue barriers, etc. we spoke about yesterday. So, you know, it's good to understand what the limitations are and whether they're going to be addressed or, or whether they're, you know, just not feasible. Um, and that, you know, that, that's okay. We can work with that. And I'll talk a bit more about how you can do that. And then I think, you know, as I said, probably the biggest barrier is around validation and implementation. And I think the current validation regime does take a long time. The, the field of especially things like organ on the chip, is moving so quickly that often the technologies are overtaking the um, regulatory stance, and so we have to deal with that. So there's really some you know, different requirements needed and a new approach to uh, implementation of uh, predictive methods. So just going back to the initiatives then, in terms of the legacy piece, I said about education, and there are lots of initiatives around education. So the... Um, uh, in the US, there's this newer um, approach, which is the um, commission, the, the Physicians Commission for, Re uh, for Responsible Medicine. They've set up a, 
a, an approach where they educate physicians and uh, other bodies, uh, um, you know, in non-animal approaches. There's things like workshops <coughs> and summer schools. So the JRC in Europe have set up uh, summer schools on non-animal approaches. And then there's things that, um, databases, etc., where you can actually see which methods have been accepted. Um, so there's lots of initiatives going on in terms of education around um, that barrier. <coughs> in terms of financial, you know, we will have that, there will be that impact of the uh, animal technologies and, and you know, uh, if people stop using animals, but there's a really big growth associated with things like organ on a chip and in vitro tox testing. And this is just some data that was pulled um, from this analysis uh, around, you know, the growth that's associated with new, um, new technologies, new approach technologies. And uh, ORCID, the, the group I was telling you about, the uh, organ on a chip in development, have done some scenario-based cost analysis, which they've estimated <coughs> there's around, uh, up to around a 26% saving that can be had uh, from using those approaches. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, a number of sort of charity funding and also organisations like the NC3R. We heard some talks yesterday that were sponsored by the NC3R, or the, the research was sponsored by the NC3R. So there are, you know, initiatives going on in, the, in terms of the financials. In terms of scientific and technical, um, I think there are still some gaps around um, our knowledge of disease cause and pathways. And um, also, you know, there was some mention yesterday about context of use. So where we have technologies <coughs> where we may not be able to be used for all applications, it's important to understand how they can be used and the uh, domain in which they can be used. And, you know, the regulators are accepting of this, so I think we should be a bit bolder in terms of what we can do here with regulators to, um, to get these uh, approaches through. So in terms of the pathway knowledge and disease cause, um, adverse outcome pathways are a, a big area. Um, if you're not familiar with this, there's lots of um, publications on this, but essentially looking at a um, molecular initiating event which causes some key events which lead to an adverse outcome. So for things like proarrhythmia, which I've worked on uh, before, you may have um, an ion channel block here, a key event may be uh, action potential duration is, a, is, is changed, and that may lead to an arrhythmia up here. So this is a great approach for understanding <coughs> the pathways that are involved in disease, but also understanding what assays are need, needed to fill those gaps. So in terms of validation, there's been a lot of work with the OECD around um, what they term defined approaches for um, a number of technologies, and, and especially things like skin sensitization and eye irritation. Um, and this is, um, you know, combining methods. So it can be just the in vitro as well as <coughs> in silico computer models we heard about as well. Uh, so they've done a lot of work around these defined approaches. The adverse outcome pathways, there's a wiki um, website where you can um, include adverse outcome pathways and add to those that are there already. And then there's a lot of initiatives around integrative approaches using those um, various technologies. Um, uh, to, to get, you know, a, a way of, of um, uh, translating what, what these assays mean. So in terms of progress for legacy, um, as I said before, I think education and training is important. Uh, we've seen a lot of pharma companies adopt uh, technologies internally. Um, there's an increase in use of these alternative methods through the three R's initiative, which goes global. <coughs> it's, it's not just uh, UK or Europe, it's global. Um, and then you get some significant uh, changes, such as the Sanger Institute, which recently announced that they are going to close their animal research facility. And that is because they are increasingly using alternative technologies. So there's, you know, there, there's industry dynamics that are changing. Um, in, in the wake of all these new technologies that are coming through. But I think, you know, as Safer Medicines, as a charity, we, you know, it's up to us also to inform and educate non-specialist scientists, politicians, policy makers, et cetera, as well, in, in terms of uh, what technologies are out there. 
Financial, we talked about, you know, various uh, groups sponsoring projects. But there's also, you know, there are some governmental um, initiatives and, and there's some progress there as well. In the US, you know, the EPA has been asked to reduce uh, the, the number of animal um, tests they do. And in the UK, while there's no specific uh, type of approach like this, you know, the life sciences sector deal, the most recent one, is funding um, the MHRA to pull together genomic data <coughs> to allow for sort of precision medicine uh, to advance. In terms of progress around scientific and technical, this is data that uh, was taken from the uh, CIPA, the proarrhythmia assay um, work that's been done uh, with the FDA. And uh, this is just showing you things like, you know, when we talked about limitations, um, how there were, in this case, there were seven uh, predictors that they looked at um, using stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and in silico modeling. And three of those were the ones that came out that could be used as uh, markers or, or fingerprint, uh, or, uh, yeah, fingerprint for um, a drug. So this was using 28 different drugs. So I think this shows that, you know, here we're saying that only three of those seven could be used, but at least it's giving you the context of use of that assay. And likewise for the organ on a chip type things, um, it's understanding, you know, what the challenges are and where the uh, technologies can be used, which applicability <coughs> domains they can be used. And then in terms of validation, probably one of the most important things, I mean, all the regulatory bodies are embracing this qualified method. So this is, you know, rather than actually having um, a methods that are uh, dependent on, you know, looking at old data, you can actually look at predictive performance of these new tests. And this can be compared to, you know, animal methods um, or even the clinical based methods using drugs whose toxicities were missed um, by those animal tests or clinical tests. Um, validation is, is being streamlined so there's a lot of read across especially in the chemical industry um, and you know having transparent uh, information available to everybody and the OECD is doing a lot of good work around um, you know guidelines around how to actually carry out in vitro methods and also um, and the initiative of uh, mutually accepted data which allows broader and faster implementation as um, that data is shared across the, uh, the OECD countries. So there are challenges still and I think, you know, talking to this point here about using um, existing uh, drugs that have failed it's, you know, there is a, a concern around which um, reference or benchmarking drugs should be used. And also, you know, the, there's been, um, the pharma companies have said that they need clear communication around regulatory acceptance. Um, one initiative we had with um, the EBTC in Johns Hopkins, which is the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, was to look at... Um, in vitro tests, so we took the TOX21 database, looked at those to see how those <coughs> compared to the animal tests that are carried out and how they have hit, uh, compared to human uh, data. Um, and these were the three work streams, so we had a evidence stream one, which was systematic uh, literature review of the animal and human data. We had the TOX21 in vitro assays and we had the human data, so the adverse drug reactions there. And the conclusions there were that the uh, animal data couldn't dif differentiate. This was for liver toxicity, sorry. Um, <coughs> we were using, in this case, we've paired drugs, so um, triglycerone and rosiglycerone are a pair of drugs. So triglycerone is a, um, a highly dilly uh, drug induced liver <coughs> injury drug. That was withdrawn from the market, whereas Rosie is a low dilly. Um, and the animal test couldn't differentiate any liver effects, and the human uh, <coughs> uh, uh, randomized controlled trials had insufficient power to detect that, whereas the uh, in vitro de de data that we took from Toxcast demonstrated that tr triglitazone was, um, had a, a lot more off-target effects than rosy glitazone. And then evidence three, which was the adverse drug reactions, um, we, we could see that there was uh, 
a higher relevant frequency of severe drug reactions, adverse reactions uh, with triglycosone. So this was basically uh, showing that the in vitro tests could have picked up um, uh, these types of toxicities um, and discriminated between those two compounds, whereas the animal tests didn't. And finally, um, just in terms of the translation piece, which is another key piece which we also need to really think about, is you know, how do these in vitro results translate to the in vivo situation? And there's a lot of in silico models, quantitative pharmacology models, um, PVPK models, which allow that translation in terms of the human context. Um, and NPS systems, microphysiological systems, uh, also need these types of approaches so that we can really understand these types of endpoints um, in terms of toxicity and efficacy in, in humans. So in conclusion, I think uh, the drug discovery process does need to be retooled. Uh, we need to come up to date, I guess, with new methods, human relevant methods rather than animal methods. Uh, there's still many barriers to adoption, um, but I think there's a lot of initiative and there's a lot of will to actually change the way the technologies are adopted. <coughs> uh, funding and education and collaborations need to be uh, coordinated through those types of consortia. And, um, you know, we need good comparative systematic data to support the use of those new approaches. Um, and I think, you know, the regulatory bodies are being more pragmatic. There's new ways to validate uh, new approach technologies uh, so that they are fit for purpose over and above existing animal models. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a lovely talk, full of information for all of us, I think. Is anybody ready to fire a question? No. Thank you very much, Jen. That was pretty good. Um, I, I'm looking at the economics, uh, thinking about the size of the existing animal market and the amount of research R&D that's yeah. spent on, on animals. Mm. And then we've got these new initiatives coming along, but I wonder whether you had any <clears throat> uh, figures or comparisons of how much research money is available for those who want to work on in, uh, in vitro compared to animals? Uh, not off the top of my head. I know there's a number of publications which uh, talk about the economics of um, in vivo and, and in, in vitro approaches. Um, but I think, no, I don't, I don't, in answer to your question, no, I don't have that. But I, I do appreciate that, you know, we need to consider that. And, and I think, you know, seeing like the uh, NIH in the US, they've been very proactive in funding these types of approaches. And, yeah, well, I mean, we probably need to be cognizant of those uh, pharma and chemical companies who are using <coughs> vivo models to, you know, not drop them basically you know it's got it's got to be handled correctly i think and that funding piece has you know there, there are there is value in animal models you know we know that but what we're saying here is um you know make sure that the in vitro models are funded as well to give them a good chance um so that we have human relevant data available yeah, so I I think that's, that's the secret. We need to increase the amount of funding that's available so the research community here, the, 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 the new scientists come along, the yeah. professors and that, can get access to this funding. Exactly, uh, exactly. And the scale of that needs to be increased significantly. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Linking into that, actually, I was wondering, is there any reason <coughs> you have found why in Europe most funding comes from charities? Like, there is any way... Mm related with the public perception, maybe? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's been a recent survey in the UK, uh, an Ipsos survey around animal use, and we're seeing, you know, the public do want to see a reduction in animal use. Um, but I think, actually, you know, the US have been a really good example of how government <coughs> funding has, you know, filtered down into various organisations, whereas, as you say, I think Europe and the UK does tend to rely a lot more on charity funding rather than the governmental funding. Um, I think, to be honest, I think politicians need to understand more in the UK and Europe about what's going on. I think the US are very open-minded and they, they are very aware of what's going on. 
but I, I, it's, I think it all comes down to education and so it links to education yeah, and, and, and you know regulators, politicians, policy makers. I think we need to do and you know that's that's a, a, a job for us as charities to do is to educate people as well in those types of areas and and then hopefully that you know our overarching funding from government will filter down in the same way it has in the US. One last question anybody? Um, just a comment on the, uh, the overall efficacy of the drug discovery platform. Mm. Um, it, it's widely accepted that combination therapy is going to be required in the future mm. and, uh, and most likely be effective. And yet, at the present, combinations can only be done with drug that have actually made their way right, right the way through the pathway. So, by definition, they have to work on their own. Yeah. So, I, the question, the comment I guess is. Is the drug discovery pipeline fit for purpose in taking two compounds that may not have efficacy until they're used together right through the pipeline? I, th I think it all comes down to just completely retooling the way we do drug discovery. I think we've, we've sat with that sort of linear process for a long time. And I think, you know, what's been realised is we need to do iterations of that. And we need, it's not a, a linear process now. It's a lot more, um, you know, trying different things. and to do combination therapies, then we need to be thinking about that. I know you can't necessarily do that at the early stages, but we do need to be thinking about how we're going to design our clinical trials or, or whatever based on combination therapies. So I think, you know, there's the whole process needs to be thought about and retooled. I, I don't think it's, it doesn't work. It's not fit for purpose, as you say, for that type of approach. <coughs> so I think we do need to think about that. So thank you very much again for your lovely talk. And we are going to go forward with the second talk of this morning, which is from Dr. Pascal.